today being a very special day in the in the traditions and the history of the church. Uh, those of you who've been around me a little while realize that I'm not very traditional. Uh, I'm not the guy that uh, that does the uh, traditional thing real well. Um, but Easter is a different day for me. This is my holiday. You know, some people like to celebrate Christmas. Some people like to celebrate their birthday and all these other things. But for me, Easter's it. Because this is the reason we do what we do. This is the reason I do what I do. This is what I've spent my entire life studying for. <clears throat> it's what I've spent my entire life preparing for, Frank. Is to share the simple gospel that Jesus died, he was buried, and he rose again. For the purpose of restoring the original idea that God had. What was the original idea God had? Why were we created in the first place? We were created to worship and have fellowship with God. Amen. See, for some reason, we get in our minds and we get in our thought process that sin is a moral condition. I want to change your definition just a little bit this morning of what sin is. Sin is simply missing the mark of what God set before you. Not necessarily a moral condition. We realize what the Ten Commandments are. We realize that there are those conditions. But do you realize over Matthew it says, For a man to do, that, that, that knows to do right and doesn't do it, to him it's a what? It's a, it's a sin. So that tells me that it's not always just the eye of lust of the eye or the pride of life. Or, it's missing or being separated from what God intended for me to be. That's why it says we were born into sin, because we were born into the separation from the presence of God. John 3.16, you like when I do this to John 3.16, don't you? John 3.16 says what? We memorize it, probably one of the first scriptures we memorize as a new Christian. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Right? But see, for so many years, I thought that meant the cosmos, people. For God so loved people that he died. But the older I got and the more I studied and the more I dug out, I understand that the word world there means the divine order. See, for God so loved the way he created it to be, that he had to send the Son to bridge the gap that will allow me to now come back into the presence of God, which gives me the choice. Because, see, this is the thing. If God so loved man that he sent his only begotten Son to die for man, that takes away my choice. He didn't do that. But what he did was he restored that gap to give me the choice back again on whether or not I'm going to enter into the presence of God. Now I get to make that choice. Now that opportunity is presented back to me. The perfect sacrifice was given. A blood covenant that cannot be broken. So much so that even pagan religions practice the covenant of blood. Every ethnic group on the face of the earth that you can study all the way back through history. There is one covenant, Frank, that can never be broken. And that is the covenant of blood. It doesn't matter what, where you are, whether you go back to the Mayans, when they would make a pact or an agreement, they would actually cut themselves, squeeze blood into a cup and drink it. That covenant from that point forward was no longer able to be broken. The Native Americans would cut their hands and join their hands together and bind their hands together so that the blood would mix. And now they would say, we are now brothers, we are now one. Well, the ultimate blood sacrifice was done when Jesus died on the cross. The perfect blood sacrifice that now says, you can no longer, the, 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 the avenue or the access into God's presence can no longer be closed. <coughs> He symbolized it in the tearing and the renting of the veil that separate the most holy place from people. He said that, that was the physical manifestation of what God was doing. He tore it up. He took the religious thing of the day and discarded it. Because he said, this is man-made, this is crazy, we're going to fix this problem. I'm going to give you permanent access back into who I am. But see, now we have to make a choice. Over in John chapter 20, starting in verse 1. This is one of my 
favorite accounts or most favorite accounts of the morning that we call Easter. And uh, Lauren, this is why we do it early. <laughs> My daughter comes in and says, I don't understand. When was the first sunrise service? Said, well, let me it just see. says early. <laughs> it just says early. Doesn't say how early. Uh, hallelujah. You have an account here where the disciples and, and, and Mary and, and the Marys and all had been with Jesus for three and a half years. They had heard his words. They had heard everything about, but the miracle had not yet become real to them. Had not yet become um, reality. One of my favorite sayings right now uh, in my own personal development is, is, Frank, what am I going to do when my confession becomes my reality? This is the point that Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, and all these were at. They were at the point where their confession, Jesus, we believe that you're going to rise again. We believe that you're going to fulfill this promise. It was coming from their confession to become a reality. But it snuck up on them. Because it said that Mary, they got there, and they got to the tomb, and they saw that the stone was rolled away. That stone was what? The separation between Jesus and them. Isn't it cool how Jesus does stuff? And when God wrote the word, he just he, he put all these things in there to let us see what was happening. There was a separation, a boulder. Okay, understand this rock. I've been to the tomb in, in Israel a couple of different times. And you, you would be hard-pressed to move it with some of the heavy equipment we have today. It's big. So this boulder, this stone that they put in front, actually dropped down into a ditch. So not only was it set, it was dropped down in, and then it was sealed. The separation says no longer can you have access to Jesus. No longer can you have this access. You're separated. You're separated by something that's bigger than you that you don't have the ability to move. But their faith says, we believe, Jesus, you're going to rise from the dead. So they get there early, Lauren, in the morning. They didn't say high noon for you. Early in the morning. They get there, and the stone's gone. The barrier is gone, but they still don't get it. They still haven't figured it out, Frank. That, wait a second, something's happened here. So instead of rejoicing and saying, Woo, -woo Jesus must be raised from the dead, they go into a period of doubting. Who stole him? Who took him? See, for, for so long they had confessed with their mouth. They had believed in their heart that Jesus was going to raise from the dead. But it hadn't yet become reality to them. It was still a theory. It was still something that they had not experienced yet. So Jesus is there and Mary is so messed up she has to take off and she runs back to the disciples to try to find some support and says they took him. They stole him. I'm paraphrasing. You can read it. John chapter 12. They stole him. He's gone. What did they do with his body? We don't understand. So Peter and another disciple take off running, and Peter was out of breath. He came in second. Another dude beats him. He's too afraid, but when Peter gets there, I love Peter. What a dude, man. This guy, he, he, he steps on every tradition that had ever been done. What's the first thing he do? He busts into the tomb and says, what's good? He's looking for a fight. But he still, even after seeing the grave clothes folded and laid on the tomb, doesn't get it. It still hasn't sank in, Frank, that the thing that I've been confessing for three and a half years has now happened. You would think at that point he would just jump up and rejoice and go run and preach and say, Jesus is alive. But he leaves depressed. He leaves downtrodden. He's like, I don't understand. But there was one who tarried just a little longer, who waited just a little bit longer, Mary. I don't know if it's because Jesus had done so much for her. I mean, we know the story of Mary Magdalene. We know that, that she was caught in the act of adultery, that she was a prostitute, that she, you know, and didn't live a great life. We also know that she's the one that broke the alabaster box and washed Jesus' feet. 
special lady, special lady, who had done so much, and, and it meant so much to her that she sits. And I don't think it's a mistake that Jesus decided to show up to her first. People that have a hard time with women preaching in the church need to wake up because Jesus made the first preacher a woman. The first one that got to share the gospel of Jesus Christ, that he's alive, was a prostitute. So I don't know who we think we are. Better put your judgment away and figure it out. I went from preaching to meddling there for a minute. That's okay. Jesus shows up. Mary said and says, what, what are you doing? What are you looking for? She's crying. She's weeping. So why are you weeping? And then all of a sudden he calls her by name. He takes what he made her and identifies it again. And her eyes are open. She realizes it's Jesus. He said, go tell my disciples. Go tell my friend Peter that I'm alive and I'm risen. But he waits for a while to show up to them. Then something has to take place, and this is where I want to hit this morning. The thing that has to take place is this. We are now at the point that says, that wasn't God called. If it is, tell him I'll, I'll catch up with him there. Good morning. It's time to get out of bed. Here's the thing that hits the point. When Mary comes back to preach the first time and shares with the disciples that Jesus has risen, they now have a choice. Do I really believe what I've been confessing all my life? Or at least for the last three and a half years. Do I believe that it is possible that Jesus has risen from the dead? Now think about it for a minute. Think about the things that we confess with our mouth. We talk about things like prosperity. We talk about things like healing. We talk about things like walking under an open heaven. We talk about things like living in victory. We talk about all these things. But what happens when we're presented with the reality of this may actually be real? What I'm talking about may actually be real. Because, see, until you experience the presence of God, until you experience healing, until you experience financial blessings, it has to be received by faith. Faith, by definition, is what? The evidence of things so forth. But yet not seen. My five senses have not determined them yet. And see, we're a creature that relies on our five senses. I need to smell it, taste it, touch it, see it. All right? We rely on that to tell me that this is reality. But it says, the scripture says, by his stripes we were healed. It's a past tense thing. It's already taken place. I just need to participate in it and make it my reality. Amen. A preacher friend of mine says this, I'm healed until God takes me home, then I get the greatest healing of all. Amen. But my profession of faith, my heart is the fact that I'm healed. That I am blessed. That I walk under an open heaven. We had a conversation on Wednesday night. Uh, some individuals say, you know, when, I, when, I, when I'm blessed, when I get this job, I'm going to give. Do you realize that the majority of people that win the lottery wind up bankrupt? Look at some of the professional athletes. The only thing money does is amplify what's already there. If you're a rascal and you get rich, you're a rich rascal. So now you just have the money to back up the stuff. But if you're a person who's loving, caring, and giving, then you're a rich person that's loving, caring, and giving. And what happens? The people around you get blessed. It's a great amplifier. But here's the problem. If you don't learn to give in your lack and in your need, when you're blessed, you won't give. If you have to rely on healing when you're not sick, and your profession all the time is, oh, well, well, well. But you've never experienced sickness. You don't have that faith that's going to take you from this place to that place. 
When you're sick, it's too late to grow your faith. I understand what I mean too late. It's just more difficult. Because the Word tells us that every man is given a measure of faith. We're all given the exact same measure of faith. The, the measure of faith to receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior. To understand the measure of faith to say that Christ died on the cross, was buried, went to hell, took death, hell, and the grave. The keys got him, done him, comes back, restores that. We have to receive that by faith. Were you there? Did you see it? I'm old, but I'm not near that old. Watch it. What's it going to say? Yeah, you thought it, though. There's the whole thing. I wasn't there. I have to receive that. By faith. Everything is based on that. On that fact. But now what has happened is because of that measure of faith and then the ability to grow that faith. To increase that faith. How do I increase that faith? Little things at a time. Dr. Polo puts it this way. It's hard to have $1,000 faith if you've never had $5 faith. You know what I'm saying? It's hard to have a miracle for the healing of cancer if you've never had the healing of a headache. We need to develop the faith. We sometimes we gotta lay hands on ourselves and you ever anointed yourself with oil? I am. They think I'm nuts, but that's okay. I'm gonna have oil, I'll just spit on myself. Jesus did it, why not? You know, to lay hands and, and to develop this faith, to grow this faith up, to make me into more than what I am now. That faith increases. And when that faith increases, then the, the, my walk with God can increase. Because I'm not going to jump out of the boat and walk on the water if I've never delivered fish that Jesus blessed. The process. The beginning of that process is simply this. Can I believe that Jesus died on the cross? History tells us. The facts are in the book. But I've got to grab a hold of it and believe it for myself. Can I grasp that? That he died. Step one. Then can I grasp that he took the keys of death, hell, and the grave and now controls it. It's his. Step two. Now's the challenge. Can I believe that he rose again. To seal the blood covenant between the Father and me. To give me that access to go back into the presence of God again. That's the surety that I have. That's the thing that I can stand on. Now all this other stuff is an increase of faith. So you've got to go back and ask yourself the foundational question first. Can I believe and accept that Jesus Christ is the risen son of the King of Kings? And if you can answer yes to that question, many of us have been to the altar and accepted Christ, didn't realize what we were doing. Back in the day when I was a little fellow, you know, they preached hellfire and brimstone and hanging over hell on a rotten stick. I got saved more times. My wife got saved every Sunday morning. She grew up in a Nazarene church. Okay? And every Sunday morning, she was at the altar getting saved. All right? I got saved all the time. I can remember running into my mother's bedroom to see if the rapture happened because I was afraid. You know, but, but the older I get and the more I developed and the more my faith developed and the more things went, I didn't have to run and get saved every day because I realized the covenant was good enough. Now I can work on the next things. Now I can work on increasing that faith. <coughs> I can get some longevity to my faith. <coughs> It'll take me all the way through the circumstance that I'm in. Because remember, when Jesus was in the boat on the storm, and he stood up and said, oh, ye of little faith, he was not talking about small faith. He was talking about faith that didn't last long enough. We're not talking about little faith. We're talking about Longevity of faith. Do I have the faith to carry me through this entire process? 
all the way through the process. I'm going to increase my faith. I'm going to grow my faith. Now, that's the measure of faith that we all have. Now, there's also the gift of faith or special faith. <coughs> that's a faith that God gives me for a specific circumstance, for a specific time, for a specific duration. Something that's above and beyond anything that I could ask, think, or hope for, or believe. God gives me that extra measure of faith for that time. That's not the faith I'm talking about right now. That happens. I've seen people that have walked into circumstances and needed a special measure of faith to make it. God gives them that special measure of faith, and at the end of the circumstance, that special measure of faith is used. It's done. So what do we go back to? We go back to the measure of faith that he's given me to begin with. That special faith has helped it to grow. This is what it means to walk with Christ and to work out your faith or your salvation with fear and trembling. Increase that which God's given to you. Increase that which God's given to you. How do I increase that which God's given to me? By allowing my confessions to become my realities. Putting into practice what I say. Sometimes that's a difficult thing to do, Frank. Sometimes when I'm in the middle of it and I'm in the middle of lack, and I say, God, I believe that you're more than enough, it's difficult for me to give. It's difficult for me to give up my time when, I'm, when I've been working all these hours and I can't, can't hardly hold my eyes open and I'm falling asleep and, and we got all this stuff going on and we still have to give. And God says, wake up and go do this. Do I believe? Do I have that, that le next level of faith that's going to take me to that next place? All based off of this one. Can we answer that question that says, I believe? I believe that Jesus died <coughs> to restore God's original plan and God's original idea. That's what he died for. Because I wasn't created in sin. I was created in the image of God. See how we get things mixed up? I was born into sin, <coughs> but I wasn't created that way. Sin is not in my DNA because I'm created in the image of God. Is it in God's DNA? Does God have the ability to sin? No. So if that's the case and I'm created in His image, then the process that we're going through is God restoring me back to my original. He's not creating me a new man. Sometimes we get stuff jumbled and mixed. What he's doing is he's taking me back to what he made me be in the first place. How he created me to be. The specialty that is God. The part of God that I am because I'm in his image. So I need to be able to walk victoriously. And the one thing that we do, you guys want to come on. The word talks to us about remembering. And the communion service, one of the purposes of the communion <coughs> service, Frank, is to remember what Jesus did for us. Okay? We know that, go ahead. The word says, by his stripes we're healed. We know that the blood of Jesus heals us. We, we know that. We know that it gives us salvation. But I want you to also know and realize that this blood is the thing that is the conduit between you and the presence of God. This is what allows you to enter into the presence of God. So when we do this communion service this morning, there are lots of things in our life that we can lay hold of, that we can claim. But I want us to stop and think for a moment and maybe, maybe change the thought process a little bit to realize that what happened here with the blood of Jesus is this is what gives me the right to enter into the presence of God. Because I'm a son or a daughter of God. And this gives me this blood... <coughs> This thing that, that God did, Thank you, sir. this gives me that access. 
This is what it took to allow me back into the presence of God. If it wasn't for this, I would still have to go to a priest to confess my sin. I would still have to rely on I would still have to rely on an animal to shed blood. I would still have to do all these things. But see, this blood took all that away. And the thing is, when I, when I think about the body, the Word tells me that there had to be a blameless sacrifice. A body that was pure, a body that was holy, sinless character. <coughs> the only way that you could know, and the only way that this could be fulfilled, was Jesus had to be tempted in all ways as we are and pass that test. Wouldn't have meant a whole lot if God just showed up and died. But he had to grow up, he had to go through the same temptations. You know, that means he had siblings. You guys realize he had brothers and sisters. He probably at points in times didn't like to be picked on and wanted to punch him in the nose. We don't like to think of Jesus that way. But it says he's tempted in all ways. So I have a brother. And I've been tempted at times to, to punch him in the nose. So if I've been tempted, I know, Michael, you've never been tempted. But if I've been tempted that way, it says Jesus was in all points tempted like I am, then there just might have been a point in time where he wanted to look at James and say, you know what, then pow. I like to think of little baby Jesus when Mary's trying to give him a bath, refusing to get in the bath, though he walks on the water. I, I think like that, I'm sorry. He, it says he went through those same obedience things. My mom will tell you that I was not always an obedient child. You don't have to go through and detail them all. But I tell people I'm not fat, I'm still swollen from her beating me all my life now. So there was times that Jesus was tempted in the fact of obeying or disobeying his parents. There were points that he was tempted in lying. He had to go through all those things so the perfected body, the sinless body, could be presented to God to settle the deal. So this morning as we partake of the bread, understand that this is the physical manifestation that fulfilled all requirements. The requirements that separated me from the presence of God. <coughs> this gives me the ability to go back into the presence of God. In that is health. In that is prosperity. In that is the blessings of God. Those are all the things that are wrapped up in. So this morning, if you are in right standing with God, which we began to talk about a couple weeks ago when we started talking about the spring cleaning we're doing. If we are in right standing with God, the right standing means that I've searched my heart. I've allowed the Spirit of God to search my heart. I've applied and asked His forgiveness in my life. Then I now can take this emblem, representation of the body of Christ, and I can step into the fullness of what I need. So this morning, you, you, you get to name it. Where is my need this morning? Is my need in a physical? Is my need in a mental? Is my need in a financial? Is it in a relationship? So as you partake this morning, you name it. You grab a hold of it and you say, your body was sufficient to meet this need. To meet this need. It's there. Father God, this morning we partake of the emblems that represent your body. Realizing that you chose to come to earth and become flesh. For the sole purpose of dying to give us access back to the Father again. So Lord, it's with that faith this morning that we partake together realizing 
that all we need is wrapped up in your body. We love you. In Jesus' name, partake together. The body was the contract. The blood is the signature on the contract. Father God, I love you. I thank you so much for your presence. Lord, I thank you for sealing the contract that fulfilled that debt that separated me from your presence. Lord, I ask that as we partook of the communion service that it would be the life to us that we need, Father. Thank you for allowing your son to come here to earth to become like us, to die for us, so that we can be the us you created us to be. Don't ever let us lose sight of that, Father. Lord, I submit everything to you that was said this morning. I ask that you would bless our fellowship and the time that we spend together until we come into the house again this afternoon, Father, or later this morning. Bless the food to our bodies and the hands that prepared, Father. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.